Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Falashade Anuse. My guest for this episode is Dr. Nkiru Balomu. She is the founder and creative director at the Africa Soft Power Project, a project focused on harnessing the African continent's creative, cultural, and knowledge industries to propel itself and people of African descent forward. Dr. Balomu is also a strategic communications and stakeholder engagement specialist with over 20 years experience advising local and international organizations on emerging market strategies, social impact strategies, gender equality policies, and crisis management. She is the founding partner at RDF Strategies, an organizational strategy and stakeholder engagement firm headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria. Our conversation covered the origin of the Africa Soft Power Project, her time as the CEO of Spinlet Group, Redefining the global perception of Africa, effective communication, and more. Hi, Nkiru. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Shade. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm tired. Yeah, yeah it's a Sunday morning. It is a Sunday morning. And you're super busy. Oh, my God. You have a lot going on. More than a lot. I know. But I really want to say thank you for taking that time to speak with me. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So... Before we get into the Africa Soft Power Project, I want to talk about your professional career. So you have 20 years experience working and you are well known as a strategic communications expert as well as a stakeholder engagement expert. But before you went into the aspect of your career, you were actually working in the African music industry. Yeah, yeah you're, you're Well, I don't know about the 20 years experience. It makes me sound old. But no, I'm... <laughs> No, wahala. <laughs> okay, you have significant experience. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you, you have very significant much. experience working, mm-hmm. and people know you as a you know stakeholder engagement expert and strategic communications expert. But you also have some aspect of your career where you, when you were working in the music industry, and you were formerly the CEO of Spinlet Group from 2014 through 2016. Mm-hmm. Right, And Spinlet was the first music streaming service and digital distribution company in sub-Saharan Africa. So can you talk about what that time in your life was like? Um, actually, Spinlet was a really cool experience. Um, it was, I think Spinlet was the first of its kind on the continent in terms of streaming music. And um, it, was, it was exciting. Um, but we were also the first movers, so there was obviously the first mover advantage thing that people talk about, but there's a lot of first mover disadvantage that um, people don't talk as much about. But I would say it's probably one of the most exciting things I've done in my life, so I look back and think, wow, we did a, ma- we did a great job, and um, you know, I wish we could do it again now. I think now would be great for Spinlet. I think, you know, te- is it 10 years now? No, maybe eight years ago. We were like just the new kids on the block and all of that. We can talk about that later as we um, continue this conversation. Yeah, because you talked about the first mover's disadvantage. Can you talk about what you mean by that? I think when you're a first mover, um, you know, it's you have to do everything. You have to um, teach the market. You have to. Um, the market is inexperienced. Um, it's like it almost feels like everybody's after you. It's good and bad so everybody's after you they want to be friends with you they want to do business with you but also everybody is after you because they think you have a lot of you know they in, in where we were that people think you have money and so everybody's after you for that as well um there's a lot of um mistakes in because you have not had the experience there's no the market is not experienced so you make a lot of mistakes there's a lot of learning curve just many things in terms of even regulatory you don't understand there are no real laws in in the space um we don't know um how the market should behave just many things you know you can imagine just yeah. being you know being the first there you have to build all the roads so it's like when you go into a village and you're building your house and literally you have to um, put the power in you have to build the roads you have to you know uh, um, put the water all of that for the whole space or for the whole village and it's, it becomes really expensive so I think that's what I mean by um, first movers disadvantage yeah and you mentioned that you wish or you wish that maybe Spinlet was operating now. Why, why do you why do you say so? Because now is the time, isn't it? Like, look at what's going <laughs> yeah. on. Like, everything is so cool. Like, like imagine if Spinlet had stayed the course and we were now. Like, we'd be like on fire. Like, you know, we knew with the burners and the waste kids and the we knew all of these people. We used to, you know, they used to be our partners with, you know, the music 
the, uh, the music agencies. We were partners across Africa. And so imagine now with this whole revolution around African content and the Afrobeats revolution and all of that stuff. So imagine Spinlet now. I just, I, I think about it sometimes. I'm like, oh, wow. And, and why did you choose to leave? Because when you chose to leave, it was still going on. I thought, you know, at some point you um, move on, you want to move on. Um, I, you know, it was draining um, mentally. It was, we knew we were working like 20 hour days. Sometimes you're like, you know, you're, you're, we worked at night as well because we're a music company. So a lot of our meetings were done at night because that's when um, artists are around. So imagine, I mean, the person that you know, imagine me having meetings. I mean, I have meetings at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., but literally you have to be like live having meetings. You're like, there's music everywhere blaring, but that's the only time you can meet. You have to go for it. You have to support artists. So you literally have to go for their shows. Shows don't start till 11 p.m., you know, so um, in, in terms of that, it's sort of like that's, I think, you know, like that would be exciting for like a much younger person. But right now I'm like, what? I can't even go to a club. Then I was clubbing every day. Clubbing for work. But it was still, you know, like clubbing. Yeah. You know, like, you know, all of that. Was, it's interesting, but I don't think that's the life that I would want to be living now. Yeah. And what do you think about the perception of people when you're the first mover? Pe- Someone has to do it first for, for other people to fly and to run and all these different things. I think what I'm trying to get at is that sometimes people say that if you start first, you may not last. But my thing is that I feel like someone else has to pave the way for other people to, you know, like it's that whole um, mantra of like we're, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I, I think I remember winning. I think we won an award. We won a couple of things. We won a couple of awards. But I remember winning, um, us winning, I, was my, t- my team and I winning the award for revolutionizing the way music was sort of like, you know, so we we're really everywhere. We were traveling the world. We were having meetings, we went to all the music shows. And I think one of the things that um, I realized about Spinlet was that the Spinlet story was was an Africa story and people enjoyed um um, people enjoyed that success story. I'd sort of like, you'd go around, people would want to speak to you. We had like, I remember sort of some Japanese DJ in New York who was like, you know, we had people sending messages from all sorts of countries wanting to come to Nigeria to hang. People particularly wanted to go to the shrine. For me, it was sort of like very clear that um, what companies can do when they have good reputations and when the world is seeing you. So we're covered by billboards, all of those kinds of things. So that sort of made it really powerful. And if we sort of, um, just thinking about it, if we had more spinlets, if we had more uh, um, companies doing, you know, similarly interesting things, uh, you know, it would be really great for the continent. And I think it's important to note that before you became CEO, you were the general counsel. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you say, why'd you say it like that? I, you know, it's interesting that I, act- I was actually a lawyer. I really can't imagine i you know right now i can't even read a legal document and understand it i'm like what are these people talking about uh, nbc says <laughs> that's not true no, my, <laughs> but go on please no i i swear to god it's interesting i always thought i was going to be a lawyer i thought i was going to be like the top lawyer i was, I was going to be all of these law things i didn't even have any thought about anything else apart from law so it's really odd that i've gone the opposite direction like it's <laughs> Oh, it's really interesting. I mean, you're, you would agree that your law degree always serves you well. So nobody can bamboozle you because you know how to read a contract, you know how to make arguments for and again. So I feel like a law degree is, can never go to waste, even though you're actually not practicing. And I, say, I think I'm saying that to console myself as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually true. But yeah. I mean, I actually don't think any degree goes to waste. I think it's what you make of it. Um, so I think for me, the law thing is like I did spend a lot of time in education. I, you know, I, I, I went to I went all the way. I, I think I'm overeducated. I wish I'd spent more time out of school. And, you know, I spent a lot of time reading. I'm, I'm academic in my leanings. But I honestly think that um, a law degree, I think law degree is a great thinking as a lawyer is very good or oh, it's a great way of being. But I also think that a music degree could be equally beneficial if you have a broad perspective. Yeah, because even when I was on just like totally diff- different, when I, was, when I was planning to go to law school, I spoke to one of my mentors and he was like, I was thinking between business school and law school. I had gotten to business school and he was like, I would advise that you go to a law school because your law school also has a business leaning. Because like business degrees only is like 
in his words, one dimensional, whereas a law degree, you have law and business, at least for the school I was going to. So he's like, with business, you can't really go and practice law. You can't even like, you know, read contracts and all these different things to a certain degree. So I don't know. Again, that's just me and my biases. So <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know, I, it's possible. I mean, he's probably right. I, if I think about it, if I had the choice today, I would not actually um, have read law. I would have read political science. I would have read um, economics. I think I wouldn't have read law because I feel like with law, I mean, and I'm not to um, uh, dissuade anyone who's on the path. I think you have to have a passion for it. But also, I do think that it takes a lot of time because you have to, you know, it's a, you do a graduate degree and then you, um, so you do your undergrad, then you have to do a graduate degree, whether you do law school or whatever it's called. And that's, and then for every country in the world you go to, you have to relearn because you can't just sort of like pick up and go. Whereas political science, economics are universal degrees. So, um, or English language. I think any degree that teaches critical thinking for me would be, um, you know, the way to go. But law is, I mean, so not to piss on law, I, I mean, I do see the, I do see what you mean. Um, I, I'm happy to, that I did read law. And yes, reading contracts, but I also feel like business people read contracts really well. So. I mean, they, they definitely do. <laughs> and I mean, you went further than I did. I so. got a JSD, yes. Yeah, so you definitely, yeah, you definitely went. Oh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in hindsight, I'm like, well, oh. but no, no, we're not pissing on law. I of think course not. I great. I mean, like, yeah. yeah, for anybody who's, you know, if anybody's listening to this and interested in law, yeah, you must continue. I would actually say do business law, so, or <laughs> music and entertainment law, so yeah. But that's cool. So um, after leaving Spinlet, mm -hmm. you now established RDF Strategies, mm -hmm. which is an organizational strategy and stakeholder engagement consultancy firm. Mm -hmm. What was the process like starting your own business, particularly for a country like Nigeria that has, you know, always going, going. So can you, <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit? So I was always a lawyer. Like I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. My, my parents were lawyers, and um, and so I was general counsel, and I became CEO. And so my brain switched, and I sort of like became more. Um, I, I switched more to management. So at some point we didn't have as much money as we we used to have a lot of money, and then we didn't have as much money. And so there's obviously obviously also investors fatigue, all of those kinds of things. And one of the things that we did really well in the time that I was CEO was that um, we had something. We had an approach that we called Snoop Doggy marketing, which is um, um, what we used to do. So if you think about Snoop Dogg and why it's how he's had a, it, it feels like he's been around forever. Like forever. forever, right? We don't. I don't even know how how old he is. But since I've been, uh, you know, I, since I've had memories, I remember Snoop Dogg. And Snoop Dogg is still the hottest thing, right? And I think that what that did, or for us, we actually used to have strategy meetings, and we'll just you know, plaster Snoop Dogg and discuss it in detail. I remember, like, in fact, okay, I'll go back a little bit. So at Spinlet, um, one of the things that we used to do is we had a read. We had to read. Because for me, you can't, we can't work together if there's two things. And if you know me, you know this. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but <I> testify, actually. <laughs> there's two things. If I tell you which pill are you taking, the, the blue pill <laughs> or the red pill, you don't know the answer. There's a problem. So you can't not have watched Matrix if we're going to work together. That's just not possible. That's one. Two, you can't not know about Alice in Wonderland and going you know you just can't because i'm like how can you go down the if you don't know like the whole point of imagination and then obviously like you know pop culture was really important to us so snoop dogg we used to have analysis about it you know and it would be that literally what made snoop dogg or what makes snoop dogg the for me the one of the most interesting musicians is that he partnered with everybody like, he's literally partnered with, you know, anybody and everybody. He's partnered with, you know, if it's Latin music, if it's all of his partnered with everybody. And I think that's also interesting, especially when, I, when you then look at this culture here where people are asking you who's there first before they do anything. It's just sort of interesting in terms of people don't understand or we don't understand as a society that to be relevant, you have to, you know, you have to be collaborative to actually remain relevant. If you're going to be, um, if you're like a 60-year-old, you need to know young people to actually understand how they think. And so that's, you know, the whole idea of, you know, the Snoop Dogg marketing. And that's what we were doing. At, so to go back to your question, I sort of like went off a little bit. No, but, fine. So um, the, the whole idea was that, um, so what do you do when you don't have um, huge, um, a huge bucket for advertising? 
because you know advertising is really expensive billboards are really expensive and so we see all these crazy billboards and we're like you know loads of money and tens and thousands of dollars so what we decided to do was actually apply the Snoop Dogg approach so like find people um, interesting people to do things with find collaborators and we did that around the world actually so um, we found that communication and I thought personally that the most important tool or asset that a company had to have was actually communication effective communication and not advertising well literally knowing how to engage your stakeholders so at Spinlet it was like obviously the you know the record labels the 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 artists themselves then you know different vendors then we had at the time we had a lot of telcos so um so telcos literally an array of different you know obviously radio stations uh uh, managers managers Mm -hmm. and everybody had their own different you know um point of view and you sort of had to and obviously your your buying public so um consumers educating consumers on you know music purchase particularly with loads of pirates you sort of had to do a lot around that. So how do you, we were doing piracy classes, we're doing campaigns around piracy, we're doing campaigns around how supporting artists was sort of like directly relevant to the ecosystem in terms of building it. We're trying to change people's mind from moving from a piracy, you know, free music and downloading from every um, anywhere to like, oh, you have to pay because if you don't pay, artists would not um, survive. They need the money and this is their work. And that's like, you know, people are, you know, when people are, getting free music from all the you know pirate platforms they don't think that this is a criminal activity because it's sort of like it's music where you haven't thought that someone curated this and this is how someone makes this is their livelihood and they can't feed their kids or their family if you don't pay for the stuff so that was all the stuff we were doing and so really apart from teaching the market we also had to that's also how we're able to sort of like um, engage with our stakeholders and so that was for me the key things I then decided that I was going to morph into strategic communication because that was what we were really good at Spinlet and if we sort of started from day one doing that I think it would have been really incredible and we were because we could see the evidence of what our strategic communication or Snoop Dogg kind of marketing or Snoop Dogg kind of communication was doing for our business and so I thought that um, if I was leaving my work this was what I was going to be able to help people do to be able to sort of map stakeholders and then say if you're talking to an investor if you're talking to a consumer if you're talking is you have to sort of like figure out what their need uh, um, their touch points are and engage on their own like you know make sure that the person that you're talking to is understanding what you're feeling so you have to actually one of my favorite sayings like you have to be able to walk in someone's shoes or walk in someone's skin that's from to kill a mockingbird which is what i have on my linkedin so yeah you're smiling <laughs> but that's um in terms of how that came about in terms of moving from um, Spinlet to uh, um, RDF. RDF. Yeah. yeah. And, and and the process of finding the right team, because, you know, one of the complaints that people have is in Nigeria, like the workforce is very, as they say, dodgy or uninspiring. So even finding the right space, what was that like? What was that process like for you? Was it, a, was it an easy thing or was it a little bit challenging? Oh, wow. Like, I think Nigeria is challenging. It was, it's challenging because I think the 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 ecosystem or the the space i feel like sometimes pe- like it's almost like the country exists to destroy you know so and it's interesting because i was coming from when i was the boss boss and i had i mean i have a, i have an interesting story about spinners and like i used to be a star like you know vip or vvip you, you keep worrying right <laughs> Yeah. I used to be really cool, like a V, like, you know, I used to go for all the parties, my skirts were the shortest, I was hot, all of these things. And then I re- when I left Spinlet, so I used to get invitations to all sorts of things, VIP, VV, VV. I remember this story, I have to tell the story. So when I left Spinlet to start my own thing, clearly all of those things ended. And um, I hadn't been to a bank in a long time. I didn't know how to open accounts anymore because they'll come to you now, the, the, the account yeah, there. They'll yeah, come to you. Yeah. They, you know, I had accountants working for me. I had, all, I had a team. I had, you know, chief legal officer, CEO, all sorts of things. I had people in, you know, working for us in Finland. We had people working in, in the States, in San Francisco. We had, you know, a cool team. We had a tech, a proper major, actually, because that tech Technology was really good. What a major tech team. So it was all of that. So that's what I was coming from. So when I, when I started my humility. Own, oh, actually, okay, the humility is too much because first of all, you're going to go and queue. The queuing, have you queued at a bank? I have. I oh really my have, God. Yeah. Then you have to do tax your um sin. Oh my God. Literally, it's like the things you have to do, it's like almost like the system says, 
we're going to get you down. We're not, you're not going to pass through this. You're not going to get, then you have to do a CAC and registration. And then the, you know, someone is telling you come today, come tomorrow. Oh my God. Actually, I have to say like, shout out to all the hustlers, all the, you know, people who live in Nigeria trying to, people don't understand how difficult it is for the small business. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that I mean, yeah. Um, But (laughs) can I just say something like, kind of off tangent is that I do think that that's why when people are saying they want to be leaders, it is important that they have gone through these struggles. Because a lot of times in Nigeria, we have people who don't even know what it is to queue at a bank or to queue to buy fuel. So how can they understand what the average Nigerian is going through? That this is just my own personal belief that I feel like whoever is going to represent you, not that they have to suffer like you have suffered. They have to actually <laughs> They don't have to go to a guy and get bottled water, but at least they should know what it means for the average Nigerian to have to queue to get water, queue to get fuel, queue to buy all these different things that the average person goes through. Because you have people in leadership who are just out of touch with what you know, what it what it means to run a country. What they must do actually is, and I we're obviously going off tangent, but I agree. I think one experience that I do think that they must experience is Lagos Airport. They have to get off yeah. the plane. Yeah. And the first thing that hits you is a dirty heat. bucket with the heat and the water is dropping. And then, you know, they just did the disarray, you know. And then we're all like, we're all people, we're civilized when we're in the UK or in America, wherever we are. And we now come and we're like, we queue, we join this long queue. And then, oh my God, it's like, they just the system wants to just take you down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so just, on, yeah. we need to it's, have it's, it's, yeah. imp- it's It's vital, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that it's just... Like you said, shout out to all the hustlers who are trying to make a difference in, the, in Nigeria and wherever they are in, in the, on the continent. Because, you know, we have all these complaints in different parts of, you know, Africa. But I want to just kind of go on to something else. So personally, you are one of the most connected people that I know. If you don't know the person directly, you know <laughs> the person's person, <laughs> person, right? So I want to ask you that for anyone who's trying to, I guess, increase or expand their network, and as they say nowadays, they want to network up with the big boys and big girls, what advice would you give to them? You want a bam bam. Yeah, you want so to exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like what I've done in the beginning part of my career is work like a dog. Like, so I'm a bit of a workaholic. So I think working and understanding your space and understanding what you are about and being confident about that is really important from a you know from the starting point. In terms of building a network, I feel like what I've noticed in people not being able to successfully build networks is that people go into conversations with their own what's in it for me. And what's in it for me becomes the so and people can most people can tell that you're about yourself. And so and I feel like that's one of the key things that we have on the continent. It's not just a Nigeria thing. I've seen it in many places. You people, um, I've just come from one of the um, countries somewhere anyway. And you can see people sizing you up and thinking, oh, like you can see the eye when they're looking at it and their thinking is what's in it for me. And so for me, I, I think what I do, I do well, um, and I say this with all humility, is I go into conversations thinking, how can you win? How can you win so that I win? And I find that to be effective in, in terms of building, you know, building, building networks. I remember somebody asking me if I could mentor them and I didn't know the person. And I was like, on top of what, what am I mentoring? You don't know me. I don't know you. You don't even know what I'm about. So why is it that we just met and it's about what I can do for you? You obviously have to sort of spend time so sort of building out what it is you can do for me. We need to build a relationship. And that's what I try to do. And it's also just not thinking about it so deeply. It's just literally just thinking when you're thinking about doing things. And like, what's in the, what can the other person achieve? Like, what do you bring to the table? What value do you have? And also just being able to have broad perspective. So I think it's just as simple as that. As in, like, understanding how people think. Understanding people, even when people are behaving badly, understanding it. Sort of walking in their shoes to understand why they are behaving badly and you know and then that sort of like helps you to map out how you should sort of navigate any situation or whatever access you have being patient as well is you know like i've been so even if even though yes uh, um i think everybody's connected 
because I'm collaborative in my approach, so I'm able, I'm transparent, I'm collaborative. So I'll ask people, and like, oh, do you know this person? This is what I want. You know, what can I, you know, what is it that they want? What are they trying to? So I, I'll go into a conversation with, what can I do, or what could I do to help that person? And then it makes it easier. But also, there's a natural. I think also sometimes it comes. Um, naturally sort of like understanding how people think that's probably um i don't know if i've been clear no 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 it totally i and to be fair to you like that's something you've always said even when i was working with you that you've always said that you need to walk in people's shoes excuse me because there are certain situations that maybe you see myself or maybe michael thinking about what about us and you're like okay really what about the person that you're trying to connect to so i I definitely agree with you that you know it's it's important that we actually walk in people's shoes as opposed to saying like what is in it for me even though that's a human nature or you know something natural that we want to do but just to kind of stay on this topic a little bit okay so you've built the network i feel like building it can be somewhat easier but how do you sustain that relationship because those are two different things i mean i think you're right sustaining it is that's where the being genuine and being about what the person what uh, and what the person or the people that you're trying to connect with or the organization what's in it for them i feel like you don't really need to try too hard to sustain anything i think think about the way i look at these things is like think about your your some of your really close friends that you don't speak to generally all the time so you probably have two or three friends that you speak to all, all the time and then you have friends that are like you know for me i have i speak for myself i have friends who are like my sisters or my brothers that were really cool but maybe we speak once a year. But you just know because of how the person makes you feel or how you've made that person feel that when you do speak that once a year, that you're, you immediately, you're connected. So that's generally how I approach my relationships, whether it is a company, whether it is, not to say I haven't pissed people off, I have, but whether it's that, uh, um, that sort of relationship, like when you build, so I, I think I always remember telling you guys where if you're writing an email, even though you're annoyed, only the person who you're annoyed with should know that your email is like bloody anybody who's i guess that's why being a lawyer is also cool anybody else reading the email be like oh what a wonderful what wonderful email you know so that never write anything in an email that you can't say to somebody's face all of those things but even when you're pissed off um with a client or whatever it is just make sure whatever you write is not doesn't see you know but sometimes you do want the person to know that you're you know pissed off but again make sure that you you are like it's only that person that knows i don't and it's a trick it's a writing trick yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean right? yeah so, yeah. so. No, no, i mean like i think just just learning from you there are times that i will write emails and you know it's, it's very true like because you, you like you said someone else would see it and be like oh this is a lovely email but you know and the person knows that you know that they me- yeah they messed up so yeah i totally, totally agree with you now over the past couple of years there's been a lot of talk about growing the continent's soft power now first of all for people who are listening or someone who is listening that doesn't know what exactly soft power is can you um, explain what that is please just briefly yeah, um, it's soft power is, if you know about it, uh, uh, it's uh, some guy, professor who was at Harvard, um, um, Joseph Nye, who coined the frame, phrase. I first heard about it when I was at Berkeley, and I think I wrote part of my dissertation on, on the topic. So in just in short, it's like using um, diplomacy, using persuasion to get people to do the things you want. Um, I think that's, for me, the easiest way that I can without getting technical. Yeah. Now, why does the continent's soft power need to be grown? or enhanced? I think that, so from my point of view, I, 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 since you know me, you, I've told this story many times that um, growing up, we grew up watching MTV Base and literally all I knew was American American stuff, you know. I even said, I, I've said before that I had a bit of an American twang and you know all Nigerians have one twang or the other. So um, you have this twang, you're like cool and it's all the things that we saw on TV. All the movies I watched were American so I actually just thought that America was the you know the best country in the world yes. and it probably still is um, and I think what makes America um, and powerful is for me the diversity of people. I saw black people on TV, I saw white people on TV, I saw um, people of color on TV, uh, you know Asians on TV and with all of the stuff that's going that, that we now know about the you know out of because of exposure and news all of that stuff it still remains the place where div- you see diversity actually working you see all sorts of people being in a room i remember some of my really close friends um in secondary school and there was one particular one who used to fail like she literally was like bottom of the class maybe you know if there's 30 of us she was always 27 or 28 and she moved to the states 
and this girl is a genius now. And there's so many men, I have a lot of examples like that. So what America does for you is it just teaches you how to think. Whereas here, you're not allowed to think. You're like, you know, it's like, do what we say. Do what I say, don't do what I do, but just do what I say. And so that's the, Amer for me, that's the American tough power. Like, you know, the movies, American soldier would come and rescue everybody. Um, you know, they will go to destroy all the bad people, you know, all of that. And so I thought everything was about, you know, and then I landed when I first, um, when I went to California and I went to, I'd never been to the West Coast. I'd always only gone to the East Coast. So when I landed, I know how California, ah, land of, so you beautiful. know, so beautiful, <laughs> land of opportunities, the where dreams are, what's that pretty woman thing? You know, remember that guy in Pretty Woman? Oh, Richard Gere? No, not the, no, so not Richard Gere, but the guy, you remember the black guy? Oh, yeah, was, what's the, your yeah, dream? What's your Every, dream? Yeah, Every, yeah, you know? yes, yes. So, um, so I had many ideas of California, the funkiest place, California, no doubt about it. That's all the stuff I knew. I just thought, whoa. And then I landed. Ah, whoa. Reality, <laughs> hits. reality hits. I was like, what? What the? Huh? This is California? I was like, ah, whoa. I, honestly, I swear to God, because I, I, you know, I, I went to straight to Berkeley and I went to the funny side, I, you know, funny side of campus. Man, I could smell weed everywhere. I was like, what? I'm like, I'm traumatized because I was an Ajibota kid now. So I was like, whoa, this is gangsters paradise. Yeah, yeah. And Berkeley is like super liberal, you know, <laughs> so, so yeah. I've never seen anything like it. So I'm like, whoa, it's so different from what I've been seeing on TV. And I'm like, that's when I realized that. And then obviously live in America. I lived in America for many years. And I'm like, ah. There's loads of things. People are killing each other every day. There are loads of horrible things going on here. It's, it's crazy. But there's loads of amazing things going on here. You're inspired. You meet people who are inspiring. And the great thing about going to Berkeley was that, you know, we were taught by um, professors. People, not prof our professors were like people who were practicing. So you had Supreme Court judges. Like, you know, Sotomayor was, came to, you know, what's that woman that's now, um, like the, the woman that is, uh, Maya, 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 Maya? That's now the, the Myanmar lady yeah, that's yeah, now yeah, on the house yeah, arrest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, was, she came to teach us many things. So you're actually, and that's soft power. Like, that is what it is. And you think that Africa has the same thing. You know, we have, we have the same exact thing. We have great things happening here. And we have horrible things happening here. But we're so many, I mean, Shadi, me and you are still here. With all the dissing we just diss Niger, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're still here because we know the hustle. This is our town. This is where I can call somebody and say, hey, what's up? You know, and you're calling the top dogs, yeah, you yeah. know? And so how are we sort of like, you know, transporting and, you know, bringing that to the forefront. And so when you hear the bad stuff, you know that it's, it's you know, there's bad stuff, but there's wonderful stuff, just balancing news. And that's the whole essence of, you know, the soft power movement that we're trying to build. And uh, So let's talk about the Africa Soft Power Project. What is it? So if I think about it, the thinking or the ideating around it set a long time. I think just spin that really, that I go back to that a lot because that's when I start realizing that this thing is actually real. I think one experience that um, we went to Cannes for the Cannes, um, we used to go to Cannes every year, and um, we went to some, you know, like off the, off the track place. And on the, um, what's that thing that spins music that you put money in? Um, jukebox? Jukebox. And um, Oju Eleba came up. And was it or some, you know, some current Nigerian music all the way in Cannes? And you're like, wow. So if you think about music, it transcends everything, you know, it's sort of like, so that, you know, that experience, but also the, my, you know, the stuff at Berkeley and thinking around, writing around, um, I think my stuff was on Nollywood and um, the, the perception of um, women in Nollywood. I think that's what I wrote about. And I talked about how culture, um, does culture um, emulate um, life or does life emulate, sorry, does t I don't remember. But I think it has to, I think I read a paper, it has yeah. to like cultural depictions of women or of something. Women, yes. And, 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 you know, and how do we, um, I don't remember what yeah. I was talking about then, but it's just, I felt like what we saw on TV was actually what was going on in real life. The way we, um, we show women, we showed women. And so that was a whole, for me, that was the beginning of the soft power thing as in like the fact that the things you see on screen can 
really actually impact your whole life and that becomes you don't even know where it comes from but also it's, it's life imitating art yes it's life imitating art or is art imitating life and so that was the beginning but obviously not crystal at the time and then moving on into rdf just having conversations again sort of crystallizing and so our focus when we said that rdf was on creative industries because that was my experience and my background but also just on you know um, organizations uh, across uh, across uh, um, but focusing on creative industries and women and so i thought okay this is interesting uh, um a lot of our call and um, giving advice on intellectual property all of that and then then moving into it and like well this is what we should be talking about and in terms of you know how africa is sort of like showing itself to the to the world and how we are seeing ourselves then covid happened and you know everybody was we were all stuck at home and you could see what you know in terms of netflix and amazon but particularly netflix and literally you spent your 24 hours watching netflix and you're like looking at the things on tv and you're thinking the most important companies in the world are content companies like you know whether it's a uh, facebook whether it's netflix whether it's um um, um bike dance whether it's um just think about TikTok, google tiktok mm-hmm. all of that even you know then think about the finance the, t- the payments company you know we're talking about cryptocurrency and uh, um all of the conversations around that and why is money um why is cryptocurrency why is payments relevant to so have actually successful content and you know you have to actually have um successful um, payment platforms and then uh, something that was key and then george floyd the black lives matter um, yeah. conversation and then we had ensas happen as well and so there's so much going on and we're like but this is even the ensas you know what happened how nigerians were able to mobilize the world to see us and then you just then realize that because of culture because of you know um where's kid because of thames because of tiwa because of uh, uh, mr easy because of you know the artists that we knew across africa people doing amazing things what's that song jerusalem yeah mm-hmm. and it's literally people are doing like dance videos is a global trend people doing dance videos on our culture and then you know um beyonce and black is king and all of that and you're like thinking about this is the this is the moment this is the moment where we can bond this is the moment where we should begin to see each other so covid was a lot of good things came out of covid because we were able to stop and smell the roses just just breathe you know and that's when we started we like there was an opportunity i thought this is an opportunity for us to actually begin to you know like we could reach people you talk about network because of covid we could reach people anywhere like you just message somebody that you've never spoken to like we love your what you're doing want to profile you want to talk to you about you know want to and then what we were doing was that was really interesting was curating conversations that there's nothing original about conversations but creating conversations that are you know bring people that are not at all related or relevant together but you don't see together and you're thinking you're having a conversation that's you're like oh wow these people are making sense even though you would not ordinarily put them on the same session so we had sessions on music on film on art on sports on um social uh, justice social justice on being black you know on uh, what is what it means to be a global african um we had sessions on you know financing um creativity we had sessions on literally and we were able to bring like major thought leaders and some some of them were like what am i actually doing on this <laughs> What am I actually doing here? People that were like not who would not consider themselves creatives were actually having serious conversations and that's what covid was able to that's one of the opportunities that came out of covid and so that's how we started. Our thing is to say that we're more than, you know, what's been shown of us, but also that um to for African businesses to understand the power that, you know, I I think I just recently wrote that Burner Boy selling out at Madison Square Garden it's directly relevant to businesses here in Nigeria because one of the things that you know you're looking for investors all of that so when that investor is seeing that image they're like oh that's right and so bad yeah you know and so when businesses begin to um understand that um i think that's when soft power begins to actually you know but also for us it's really important there's this whole brain drain the brain drain thing going on and you know people are leaving because they're frustrated young people are leaving and i think that you know the creative industries technology all of these things offer a great opportunity um and also is you know for me it's something that young people can access most easily you know that's why soft power is really important so when you hear bad news you hear when you hear hush puppy 
and you hear all the bad stuff. And there's a, there's many many hush puppies in America. There was yeah. I mean, the Enron happened by itself. The, you know what I mean? But that doesn't stop you know the whole story about you know uh, um, Amazon and Netflix and all the great things are coming up. It's just balancing stories, and that's what we're about. Yeah. So you had a couple of events virtually, which yes. is which is great. Now you're going to have a physical event in Rwanda, and it's going to be <coughs> from May 26 to the 27th. It's May. It's actually um. So yes, um, we had virtual where we thought, okay, it's time for it. It's, okay, the virtual thing is really difficult. I mean, you're part of it. And people don't understand that virtual events, especially when you're having back-to-back 15 events, that it can murder you. Like, you can just die from the virtual. Yeah. It's actually so much harder. That's Not the physical. bad thing about um, COVID was that, well, people are like, oh, but it's just a virtual event. I'm like, no, the planning that goes into having a summit yeah. virtually is just a lot more than the plan that goes into having a one-day, two-day, three-day summit um, in person. So after all the suffering we suffered with the, you know, the virtual ones, we're like, ah, oh. I mean, you can attest to this, that we have to go physical. But also the yeah. building networks and building relationships, I think you do better when it's um, um, physical, in person. in person. So we had one in Miami um, during Art Basel because obviously art is a core part of our existence. And that was really, that was super successful. So our strategy is to have um, summits around things that are happening. So as not to reinvent the wheel, but also our, our strategy is also collaborating. We think that what Africa needs to do better um, is building collaborations. And so for us, Rwanda was like, um, uh, it was actually Rwanda or Ghana, but we end up at Rwanda because of the um, Basketball Africa League games, um, NBA Africa playing. And we've had um, we've had some of them, some of the speakers, um, Victor Williams and um, Amad Afal. And so we thought because they're playing in Rwanda, this might be a great opportunity to collaborate so that people are coming, people are not coming to, the, to the, they're not going to, we're not dividing or splitting our audience. So people who are coming to, and Rwanda is beautiful. Um, they have a great policy in terms of um, how they um, treat um, visitors, I think a strategy is actually to attract visitors. So it makes it really, in, in terms of a place to visit, think, you know, you spend 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes at the airport and from when you land to when you exit the airport. That's never happened to me in, in the... <laughs> <laughs> so the airport experience is actually, you know, so, and then it's visa on arrival, so it's not complicated. So it just makes it, and so when you then say, um, oh, Rwanda, and then people are like, why Rwanda? For all of these reasons, Rwanda is not um, extraordinarily expensive, it's affordable. So that's actually why we decided to go to Rwanda, because of the activities that are happening already, collaborations that we have already, the partnerships that we've built, and also just sort of like supporting African um, African businesses and African um, countries, making them a core destination for us. So, yeah. Cool. And some, so who are some of the speakers that are going to be um, at the summit? Um, we have a couple of sessions. Um, so because we're because it's a two day summit, a two half day summit, we have um, a, a session on payment. Um, we have the CEO of PAPS, which is the um, payments um, settlement. I forget the long form, but PAPS it's prob- it's the newest thing and the coolest thing that's happening on the continent in terms of innovation around payments. Anyway, there's a lot of new ama- uh, amazing things happening, but they're really doing cool things or they aspire to do cool things. And so they're speaking around um, how you can't actually have a content revolution without efficient payments, which is what that panel the session is about. Then we then have a, a, a session on scaling African talent. And we've talked already about, you know, the culture of education here. And for us, it's really important to think about how we can rejig education. And when you look around in terms of talent, how are we building young people's talent, this whole idea of a four-year university, does everybody need to go to university? What are you actually learning in university? Me and you are here sitting down and we don't, the things we learn to university we're not using in our daily life. So so do you need a four-year program? Is a one-year program okay? Is a six-month program okay? How do you build a scale of talent where people are not longer saying, you know, businesses say we can't find talent, we can't find people who are equipped to do work. And so that's really core for any, I mean, for any um, country that wants to be a superpower. It's human capital is the most important thing. And what we do have a lot of is human capital, but the human capital has to be capable. And so that's a core thing for us. And then we have a 
session on um, on music, and we have MI actually, um, Nigeria, and we have um, Vet Gill who runs, who's co-founder of um, African Creative Agency, AC, I think. It's yeah, called. AC, I think yeah. So. Um, coming from um, Ninel, who's um, from the the um, top um, Afri- uh, South African agencies as well in music, and then the next day we have Financing Creative Power. Um, we have Bank of Industry, and they've done a lot of work around financing creative power and financing innovation. And so one of the core things that we sort of find in terms of financing is that the financing or the investors don't understand the creative sector. The two people, the two sides don't understand each other. So it's really important to us to build that connection, to explain, to educate the market. But also, it's not just from the creative side. It's also from if you have um, uh, someone who's sort of like... Um, building loans or whatever it is around creatives and does not even have an idea of, you know, if you don't even like music and you don't like, you don't watch movies and that might not be so bad, but if you don't even understand what the trend is, then you can't understand how a creative thinks. And so if you don't understand how a creative thinks, then how can you actually help them to understand the, you know, the different, you know, um, bottlenecks or whatever that they have to deal with. And of course, from a creative sector, you can't be so impatient with the banker who does not understand what language you're speaking. So our role at Africa Supply is to help to uh, um, build that bridge in terms of communicating how the two people are thinking and how they can see each other. Um, so I think that's really important. So that's the, the, the conversation around that we're trying to build around that. And then obviously we can't do anything without inclu- making sure that women are profiled properly. So we have a session on women communicating Africa forward. And then I think we are, we are going to have a fashion session. We weren't sure about it before, but we're working on some something really exciting and if that pans out then we have a shoe show we have a shoe which is really interesting we have a, a shoe show uh, yeah a sh- <laughs> yeah because we have a one of our um, partners um uh, is the biggest uh, leading luxury shoemaker in brazil and so they're and since they're coming to speak they're like well why don't we just do a shoe show yeah. catwalk or whatever and that's really going to be cool so we have this thing we're calling a glam tail which is a glamorous cocktail we've we made up that word i think we made it up but we haven't checked so if it's yeah if it's people you can't trade market <laughs> <laughs> so just because I'm not sure, but if we're the ones who made it, who came up with it, glam tail. This is you're hearing for the first time here, so we're having a glam tail. And so envy, I'm the first. Why is there a So glam tail, you heard it here the first time. Now, if you Google and it already exists, well, that means there's nothing. We already, we also say there's nothing like an original idea. So glam tail, we want to have African design. Sorry, no, African designers because there's a difference. So the glam tail, we want people to wear their African designers to come. We don't mean to for you to wear Ankara. If you're Ankara, it's cool. That's fine. But none of that scarf, whatever it is, I'm going to church. Look, no. Your glam, like, what is it if you're, you know, on the runway? What African designer makes you feel like you're the hippest thing since sliced bread? That's what we're trying to do. As in, like, so wear your African designers to this glam tail. We sort of, like, my trip I'm curating because it's obviously very important to, you know, you know, I'm not very serious about these things, but I'm taking it seriously. I only want to wear African designers on <laughs> yeah. this trip. So um, I feel like we have to stand for something. So that glam tail thing. So we have a welcome um, cocktail, um, a welcome party for Africa Day, which is on the 25th. So on the 26th, we have this um, um, yeah. sessions during yeah. the day. They're half day sessions. And then we have this glam tail on Thursday. Then on Friday, um, we have the session again. And then we're doing a, a trip to a distillery in Kigali. It's really cool. Um, and we'll have dinner there. I've heard that they have the best um, view in Kigali. So that would be wonderful. And then on Saturday is the basketball um, finals. So we'll obviously go to the game. And, but we have a pre-exclusive pre-game event that we're having um, for our, you know, select um, VIPs who have, you know, broken their backs working to make this event powerful. So that's um, from that. And then we have, we have a session with the NBA um, on Tuesday, you know, on Wednesday, where we're speaking about Africa Top and its importance. Of course, we have a sports panel. I, I don't know if yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. You know, sports is very key for us. So we have a sports panel. Um, which is looking really interesting. We have a, a, the, f- the first um, makers of running shoes, uh, which is a Kenyan company, and it's like one of the co-founders, a woman, so exciting that's conversation. Exciting, yeah, yeah it amazing, is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, and then on Sunday, we wrap up and begin to head to our different destinations. Yeah. But I, it's, I mean, it's looking like it will be exciting. That's great. That's great. So if someone wants to attend, someone, you know, how do they, is it, is it, is it invite only or, you know, how can they join or participate in this event if they want to? So it's, not invite only you can actually buy tickets um we have um tickets on our website which is um 
africasopa.com. Africasopaproject.com. I'm sorry, Shadi, you even know more than me on these things. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Africasopaproject.com. And then also on Eventbrite, you can buy tickets from there. And then, of course, if you're friends with one of our sponsors, um, they also have tickets that they're giving away to their um, partners. And so there's many ways of getting tickets. And, of course, you can, if you're friends with Shadi, she can also get you. <laughs> And <laughs> that's one chance. So. <laughs> if you're friends with Shadi, she can also get you tickets. So there's um there's um many ways. And if you wanna, we have tickets for um for people who are interested. Um, we have a couple of tickets for um people who wanna come to Kigali that we're also giving away. So um any listener of the podcast who wants a ticket can get in touch with Shadi and get a few free tickets. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Hopefully we do this before you know the event actually happens. That'll be super exciting. Now, final question, MB, is I had a couple of questions about how people say African storytellers seem to whitewash the continent and they talk about all the glam and the glitz and how it's partying and all these different things but you kind of alluded to the fact or you're not even alluded you've actually spoken about the fact that there are two sides to every country you have the good and the bad so we can't always say that every African storyteller who's showcasing the good parts of the continent is quote unquote whitewashing the continent right would you agree I, 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 I agree. I actually agree to a large extent because the storyteller should tell the story they want to tell. Um, and there's already all sorts of, you know, I don't think that anybody who says African uh, storytellers are whitewashing the continent. There's a lot of blackwashing or whatever, you know, I, you know whatever that is where the stories are all bad. I read a, a piece on the FT uh, um, about um, the Korean pop um, how soft power and Korean pop and right. where are those stories about? Like, you know, we need to have global mainstream media write powerful stories about the continent, like powerful stories, because those are the platforms that people take seriously. So if they're not writing it, we gotta write write the stories ourselves and hope that, you know, we get enough. That's why collaboration is key. Because there's a lot of we I mean if you turn on CNN you see the um, you know babies with flies and all of that stuff. So we don't sort of owe anybody to tell the stories that we don't want to tell. So if you're whitewashing, whitewash away. Um, if you wanna tell whatever I mean I think people should be true to um, what stories they want to tell. So I wanna talk about just I feel bad Balance is really important, um, but then there's a lot of um, you know uh, people talk about pop culture storytellers. That's what they want to talk about. If you talk about music or um, whether it's um, what new, new Housewives of Lagos or all oh of really yeah, yeah 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 but there's also the same thing and everywhere else. So why why do we get this for those things? I think people should tell the stories they want to tell as long as we keep the balance. And also it's the African storyteller doesn't owe anybody anything to tell a different story. A final question is you kind of talked about the challenge sometimes when it comes to investing in the continent, creative and whether it's you know knowledge or technological industries now my question is how can or rather should i say why should more moneyed african individuals invest in the creative and knowledge industries as opposed to waiting for outsiders to be the ones to invest in the continent um Actually, that's a really cool question and one that troubles me. Um, my own experience and um, just working here is there is something wrong with us. I'm sorry. We are complaining about We complain about oh, how people don't see us, how blah, 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 all of the things. And they are true. But then when it comes to our own, we're not actually... I think one of the things I would say is we have been generally failed by our leadership. Not all the time, but we have. But um, I think... For me, one of the most um, unsettling things about being here is the lack of foresight. That we don't think about the future. We are thinking only about now and yesterday. Um, actually, maybe now. And so that's why people that should know better don't actually have, they're not visionaries or we're not visionaries. And then when the person now, like, okay, now everybody's looking for burner, 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 whisk it, whisk it, whisk it. But when they were starting, where were you? You know, and if people were more there for young people, if, you know, business owners actually understood young people better and understood that to be relevant, you actually have to, you know, um, I don't understand when people want to hoard things to themselves and you want to be this able, this, you know, I'm the owner of the world and we all have come and meet in your office and wait for eight hours and you keep us waiting for eight hours to have a meeting with you. Whereas I can meet the CEO of a huge company in America 
just two minutes, you know, like you set appointments, you, you know. So that's a core thing. I think for me, I've been thinking about it a lot, is a lack of vision. It's a lack of foresight. We only think about the now. And I think that's what, we, what, we, what needs to change. Not understanding, you know, strategy around building succession and building, you know, how do visionary companies or visionary organizations succeed? It's about sustainability. And how can you sustain if you ignore 70% of your population. You don't even know what's interesting to them. And then considering that you didn't get there by yourself, what did you have? It's not like you're smarter than anybody. You had access to somebody who gave you something and you, you know, things that you're hustling some company to do. That you have a meeting, oh, some more people person, that's fantastic, let's do it together. So that's why they, we're looking for investors, but not, they're not coming from Africa. And so that's something, that brain switch. But I also have to say, that more people are understanding, more people are, you know, uh, um, beginning to see why it's important, more people are getting it. And so it's just sort of, we need to just move faster um, because the world isn't waiting for us. So we need to move faster now. And again, that's what Africa South Power is trying to do. The Africa South Power Project can create conversations and arenas where businesses and creatives can actually see each other and begin to understand the power that both bring to the table. Yeah, I think it's just so fair to say to the, about the Africa Soft Power Project. I say that as a former employee, is that you're actually not just having conversations. There are actually connections that are being built. Like I've, you've seen deals happen because someone was on a panel with another person. So I think you should also give yourself more credit than just conversations. No, yeah. of course. Um, yes, of course, of course, of course. No, we are doing powerful things. Um, we, we don't have humility about this. Um, but the question was sort of like, you know. About, no, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, but we have seen people connect on the platforms. We've had people... We We've had people from, you know, South America. We've had people from, like, so Brazil, Colombia, all of them. We've had people from those places. We've had people in the Caribbean. We have people from, these are, like, really interesting people. We've had all sorts of writers, you know, like, so um, that's important. And we've had connections where people have done deals from having a Zoom conversation. I'm like, oh, I see you. Oh, I see you. So that's really also part of the things that we're trying to do, connect, build connections that can be monetized. Yeah. So it's not just, of course, you're right. It's not just about um, conversations about what's the outcome but a core thing for us is also creating you know this powerful story think about davos and how we all pack our bags and go to uh, um, davos for things why are people not packing to come to rwanda or packing to come to ghana you have to create platforms that are owned by us led by us that invite people to come into our space to bring whatever they have bring it to our space you know there's tourism there's all sorts of things that can benefit from attracting people to the continent and that's part of what we're trying to do yeah and the reason why i actually chimed that in is i mean through that point in is because you know lots of times people say all these conversations are happening 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 where is the outcome right so i just wanted to make sure that you know we understand that it's one thing for us to have, have conversations another thing for um tangible outcomes to actually happen from those conversations you know yeah 100 so, percent. yeah 100 yeah so we're going to move on to the fun random questions oh. are you are you ready? <laughs> well, I mean, let's see what they, what let's see. So the first question is, what was the last book that you read? Oh, that's interesting because you're in my house and there's loads of books everywhere. But what was the last book I read? I think I read um, uh, Gender by Design. I think, and that was for work. I was sort of doing work around designing um, something around gender equity certification, and I read the book. Okay, cool. Second question is favorite song right now. Hmm. Uh, it has to be um, Kweku the Traveler. <laughs> <laughs> All these fans. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, it has to be that. You know, I actually, I was in Ghana. Um, I was in Ghana a few weeks ago or last month. And I was so tired one day. And then one of my um, partners that I, I'm on the board of um, a, a Ghanaian organization. And so he was having something at his house. And he says, oh, the um, guy was going to be there. Ah. The tiredness left my bones. <laughs> you jumped. I was up. like, what? Uh, I felt like a, a video vixen or whatever. Because I was like, I'm coming now. And I was so tired, but I still yeah. went. He didn't turn up on time, and I was so tired. I yeah. went without seeing him. But Aww. can you imagine that I ran to Ghana yeah. and meet the guy? So, yeah. yeah, that's my favorite song right now. Okay, third question is, name four women that you would love to meet but are yet to. Uh, four women that I want to meet that I'm, I'm yet to meet. Four. Uh, that's plenty. Of okay, let's do two. Two women that I want to meet. Oprah. I mean, like, who doesn't want to meet Oprah? Uh, I'm torn. I have to say Michelle and Oprah just because. Okay, I'm going to add Hillary too. Just, you know, so there's three now. Um, I would say Oprah, Hillary, and Michelle. Just, I just want to 
sort of hang out. It's like sort of chilling with the big boys. So those are my big boys. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want to bam bam, I want to chill. That's, that's, those are the big boys. So yeah. Yeah. All right, that's cool. Now, in one sentence, or you can fill in the blank. So, I, <gasps> no, I forgot one woman. She I was a four. four. She yeah, was a yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Habba, habba, habba. Um, Mia Motley as well. Like, I would like to meet her as in like i think she's exceptional so for now my brain is beginning to work i'm like ah, i can actually do 10 see but see? yeah four is fine okay cool so fill in the blank africa is hmm africa is does it have to be one word or it can be a sentence it can be one word it doesn't matter africa is exciting and challenging at the same time final question is what are three words that you live by three words huh I can give you a sentence. Phrases. Whatever, yeah. Phrase. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would say treat other people how you want to be treated. Um, that's one. Apologize if you need to. You know, don't be fe- afraid of apologizing. I come from that. I, I talk about that because I'm an employer and I feel like, you know, if someone's older, they, it's like, oh, you shouldn't. I think you must. And I think the third one, which is what I have on my LinkedIn, is like, um, you know, learn to walk in other people's Um, shoes to understand where they're coming from. All right, we have come to the end of our conversation. MB, do you you have any last words before? Last words of wisdom. Yeah. Nothing really. It's been fun being here. Um, I feel like, um, you know, I think life is for the living, live your best life, all of the usual nothing exciting words but yeah i think that's we should just try to um people are dying every day so living your best life you know is probably uh, yeah i think i uh, i think i like that living your best life so yeah those are the okay that's good no it's true people are dying every day so thank you for that you. i wish you and the team a successful art in rwanda thank and you thank you so much. much for your time this episode is edited and produced by fala shade anosie theme song for the pod is by john akinola If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and leave us a comment on iTunes and Spotify. It really, really makes a difference and helps the show get discovered. The podcast is also available on Podbean, Audio Mac, Google Podcast and Stitcher Radio. Simply search for T-H-E-S-N-C Podcast. You can also check us out on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thank you for listening.